Welcome to Design Domination, where you'll gain confidence, clarity, and a competitive edge in a crowded marketplace so you can dominate your competition. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Colleen Grotzer, and in this episode of Design Domination, I'm joined by special guest Josh Hall. Josh is a web design business coach, a podcast host, and web agency founder who lives and works in Columbus, Ohio. Through his online courses, his podcast, and YouTube channel, he teaches web designers how to build their dream web design business that gives them freedom and the life they love. Visit Josh's website at joshhall.co or find him on Facebook or YouTube. Welcome to the podcast, Josh. I'm so excited to have you here. I'm excited to chat with you again, Colleen. Thanks for the invite to come on. You were recently on my podcast and we talked about a subject that I am learning about, which is website accessibility. So you offered my audience a lot of expertise in that. So hopefully I can give some value to, to all your listeners about conversions and uh, yeah. some website tips, which I always love talking about. Yeah, so we're going to get into lots of good stuff. People need to take some notes <laughs> about their portfolio websites. <laughs> get, the, get the notepads ready. Yeah. Okay, so we'll start off with some fun questions. And the first one is, would you rather be the passenger in the car or the driver? Driver. Don't even need to finish that question. I yeah. would 100% <laughs> be the driver. Yeah, maybe that's like the controlling business owner in me, but I so prefer to be the one literally holding yeah. the wheel. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I certainly relate to that. <laughs> now, the other question would be, would you rather win the lottery or live twice as long? Twice as long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Twice as long for sure. I actually, the idea of like inheriting or winning money, I think it's pretty well known that it generally doesn't turn out well. And I don't care yeah. who you are. I feel like if you get handed something, you just don't appreciate it. But when you work hard and then you earn it, earning is so much better than just receiving. So that's a whole nother topic for discussion. But uh, <laughs> uh, wow. I mean, you could take that in the business world rather than just having something handed to you like a, like a business you inherited versus you like creating it from the ground up. Of course, that person yeah. who built it with their blood, sweat and tears is going to care about it more. Yeah, that's true. Good point. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of designers will go and put up a website and they'll make it look super nice and they'll put their work on it and their work will look great and everything, but they're not thinking about SEO or conversions. And of course, to get clients, we need to get people to our websites and then we need to keep them on the website and hopefully take action. So the first thing I want to kind of talk about is let's define what's considered like a high converting website. Well, I think you can you can measure conversions in a lot of different ways, but you have to have some sort of goal with your website. This is one of the primary things that if I could go back 12 years ago, 13 years ago now, when I first started designing websites for clients, if I could go back to Josh 13 years ago and say, focus on this one thing for your clients, it would be determine the goal. Like, what is the goal of this website? What do you want your customers to do? And I know that sounds simple and elementary, but the simple things to do in business and in life are so simple not to do. So it's so easy to overlook them. So the first thing is you got to have a goal. And that is generally going to determine your messaging. It's going to determine your content. It's going to determine your call to action or calls to actions if you have multiple call to actions. And it's literally going to help you frame how you design and build your site. Uh, you talk a lot about accessibility. Technically, I think it's probably safe to say if you have a site that is confusing, that's probably an accessibility issue. Uh, so the clearer you get in the goal of the website, it helps every party involved. But it really starts with the goal. Like literally, what do you want people to do? Do you want them to submit a like a quote form to get a quote? Do you want people to call you? Do you want people to buy something on the site? Do you want people to schedule a free consultation? Ask your clients, what do you want them to do? And then we can literally build out the entire site from there. And I think something too is that, you know, a lot of designers, a lot of people in general, actually, a lot of business owners, a lot of freelancers focus on like how much traffic is coming to my site. Like I don't have huge numbers, so I need to increase my traffic, right? Or I've got to get tons of clients because that's what everyone's always talking about is like getting new clients. But it's like, you don't have to have huge amounts of traffic to have to have huge numbers of clients to have a profitable business too. But when it comes to Google Analytics or like any kind of SEO traffic tracking measures, 
what do you think are like some good ways to do that make it easy for designers? Well, I think for for web designers especially, but this will probably be the case for all designers. You said it, Colleen, you don't need that many clients. So you do not want to look at quantity. You want to look at quality. And from the analytics perspective, it's much more important to look at like percentage rather than the actual numbers. So for example, I have a, a couple colleagues who run a digital marketing agency, a design agency in Nebraska called Artillery Media. They do not have that many people that look at their website like that clients. But what they do have is really high conversions with the really good clients. And even if they just get 100 visitors in a month, if 10 of them convert and they each pay five or $10,000 for a website, that's huge. Like this is this is such an important point when it comes to measuring conversions and looking at stats. It is 100% all about quality over quantity. So don't compare yourself to other metrics and stuff, look at like, what do you need in your business? If you need two clients a month that pay you five or $10,000 each project, then to getting two people to convert, that's your goal. Again, going back to like, what is the goal? And that's going to help you figure out your numbers. As far as some metrics, even if you just want to look at those metrics, there's a quite a few different things you can do with analytics. Um, I actually use an analytics platform called Fathom. So Fathom is GDPR compliant. Google Analytics, surprisingly, is not. I don't know how much you know about that world of things, but I've, much like accessibility, I'm learning more about what's going on and what's changing in that landscape. And there's a lot going on in the analytics world, but the short of it is, uh, with privacy issues and things going on, Google Analytics is kind of playing catch up to, to, to uh, GDPR compliant analytics. So anyway, I use Fathom, but whether you use Fathom, Google Analytics, Monster Insights, or whatever it is, one of the, the the biggest things you can look at is bounce rate, which basically means people coming onto your site and then leaving without taking any other action. You could look at bounce rate for your homepage. You could look at it for landing pages or service pages. Bounce rate is typically what you want to try to get down as much as possible. Uh, quote unquote, experts say you want to try to get bounce rates under 30% or so. I think that's probably a good metric. You generally don't want to have like more than, you know, half of your traffic leaving without taking any other action. So bounce rate is a great place to start when you're looking at analytics. Again, you don't have to look at the actual numbers of people. Look at the percentage. Like what's mm. the percent out of 10 people, how, how many of them are leaving without doing anything else on your website? And that's a good metric to work on. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of designers compare themselves to others and like what the other designers are getting you know, how many clients they're getting or how much traffic they're getting, you know, if they're talking about it, that is. But yeah, yeah like you're, you're saying, like, I think that goes back to the goals and understanding what your goals are and what you actually need in order to accomplish those, those goals. And real quick, when it comes to comparing yourself to other designers and agencies, just remember, first off, everyone's different. Second off, comparison is going to lead to all sorts of terrible things. It's going to oh, yeah. make you feel bad about yourself. And every design shop and every designer, solo print, we're all different. We all have different goals. And quite frankly, I have, in my journey, I've known a lot of agency owners, some with like big agencies that were doing multi six figure and seven figure agencies. The majority of them are not doing it anymore because they burned out or they have so much churn in their agency that it's just become this beast that they can't even control. Mm. I loved having a very small team and just having a much more of a solopreneur approach to my business. And I had to learn that the hard way, not to keep on looking at everybody else. Stay in your lane. Uh, I know we're getting outside of conversions, but that's, uh, yeah, a really, that's okay. it's a really important topic when it comes to measuring your success, because you have to measure the success for your situation and your business. And that's not going to be the same for everybody else. Well, you know, that's an interesting point that you brought that up because, you know, the other thing I was thinking about, which goes back to this topic, it, so I think it does relate because like having your story on your website is important and that can really help connect with somebody who's looking at your site, a potential client, right? But a lot of designers want to be this bigger team and they're always saying like, clearly it drives me nuts when I go to websites. I know it's a solo designer and I they're wee, wee, weeing like all the way home. Right. And it's like, I struggled for many years with like this I versus we. Yeah. And it just felt like it was inauthentic. Cause it's like, well, I mean, I was an I at the time with no small team then, but it was, I was an I, but I'm like, but if I'm not a we, then I'm not going to get the big projects. But I feel like when we're more authentic and just own 
our situation, I think that actually is better than trying to struggle with it and and what we say on a website about it. So I have a cure for that, or at least it's the cure that worked for me when I was going from me to we, which was a, a really, really tricky area of my business when I started to scale. It sounds like you did as well. And that is, first of all, yes, you do not want to false advertise yourself. You don't want to, because I see the same thing. I see so many people <laughs> who start their business and like, we're a massive digital agency <laughs> and I know it's a dude in his parents' basement kind of thing. But what you can do, especially if you are in some sort of web design community, which mo I think most people are now, if not, definitely get into some free communities, get into a paid community of really good colleagues and partners. They are your team. Because yeah. you can, and this is what I learned is even though I didn't do all the things, I tried to surround myself eventually with people who could do those things. So on a team page, uh, even if they didn't like work for me full time, I had a lot of colleagues on there that I would just say they collaborate with me occasionally. Yeah, this, I oh used my to gosh. do that. Yeah. It's genius. It's the best way. To, I don't, I was going to say, I don't think I came up with that. I think I probably saw it and was like, oh, that's a good idea. Because I did want to go from me to we for those bigger projects that were like, quite frankly, we're a little, and I had clients say this, they're like, I'm a little worried about you doing everything because I'm afraid you're going to get burned out. And I've had problems with designers who have flaked out and got burned out. So I learned to say like, I am the creative director. I run the ship and I, I do a lot of the things that, I, that I'm good at and that I'm going to be the you know primary communicator with you. But I have a team of people when needed or like if we're going to go this direction on SEO or if I were to meet you now, Colleen, and we were going to do some accessibility stuff, I'd say I've got Colleen to handle some of the accessibility stuff. Exactly. That's the way to go when it goes from going to me to we. And I think it's since it's more authentic, you're more confident talking about it too. Because I remember like, being so not confident when I would say that because it felt like I was lying and I'm so against doing anything like that. I just yeah. felt like it didn't feel right. So don't yeah. lie. Yes. <laughs> yes. Don't, it, uh, you don't have to say like, I'm working, you know, on my ca basement couch in my parents' and basement. Right. You don't have to say that, but just say <laughs> you're, you're, you know, you have collaborators, like people who can help you out in the project if need be. Staying small is the next big thing. Uh, and I know there's mm -hmm. a lot of books out there on that topic, but it is totally true. I don't know what you've seen in the landscape, but I've actually seen that the term agency is really frowned upon by a lot of clients because they felt like just a number on a spreadsheet. And they get with a salesperson who turns them over to a creative director, who yeah. turns them over to a project manager, who turns them over to a designer. And then they're like, I just work with 10 different people. I don't know who to talk to. Things aren't going well. The lines of communication are tricky it's not always a great thing to be an agency. Now, right. I'm not, you know, if that's the way you want to go, awesome. There's a ton of resources out there and a lot of people can can help you build a seven-figure agency if you want. But from my personal experience, there's a lot of power in being like a small team and just you and some trusted folks that you work with. They don't even have to, quote unquote, work for your business. They can just work right. with you when needed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to SEO for a bit since we were talking about that. So with SEO, so you're talking about Fathom in place of Google Analytics. With Fathom, do you find that easier to use than Google Analytics? Because Google Analytics yeah. makes my eyes glaze over. Yeah. You know what's funny? <laughs> my most popular or my second most popular video on my YouTube channel is a Google Analytics tutorial. Mm. The reason it's so popular is because I am a simple guy. I just... I was so confused by it for years. And then it just dawned on me that analytics is really three main things. It's who's coming to your website, what are they doing, and how did they get there? That's what we're looking at when it comes to analytics. So that's what I was able to dumb down in that little 10 minute uh, Google Analytics video I used to do, uh, or that I posted on my YouTube. And I think that's why it resonated so well. So same thing with Fathom. Um, it is analytics. However, it is a much more streamlined, just simple tool to use. It's it, While it may not be as robust when you drill down into it, their kind of goal is that they don't want to be. They don't want it because Google Analytics is, while it's powerful, it is intimidating and it's really confusing. Um, so yeah, it's something that you're able to measure SEO. And I, I mean, I am an affiliate for Fathom, but I'm not from Fathom. Uh, I'm just saying from my perspective, it is much easier to, to manage and just to look at the, the clean stuff that you want to look at. Again, what, who, how? That's what you're looking at. Oh, well, okay. So speaking of who, what, and how, let's talk about who, what, and why, <laughs> and mm, maybe yeah. like a UVP and the clarity 
on what you do and who you do it for and how that's important for a website. So the what, who, how, and why um, is absolutely key for websites. Now, the reason I pause there with why is I don't always recommend diving into why on the homepage of a website. What, who, and how, those are the big three. If you wanna do anything on your website, focus on what you do, who you do it for, yeah. and how either how to get started or how you do it. This is where you could potentially add in a process if you have something like a you know one, two, three type of process, which makes it really easy for a potential client to move forward. The why, and I'm a huge fan of like Simon Sinek and his book, Start With Why. I think it's really mm -hmm. beneficial. However, in some cases, I think the why is almost almost better if it's like a layer back if somebody really wants to know like why they need to do that or very uh, tactfully put in there and, and and some sort of flow for a website so it can be on a home page and and i actually i'm going to contradict myself because m the tagline of my podcast and what i do is to help people build a dream web design business so the why is so they can have freedom and lifestyle they want to live. So my why is in my taglines. Like you can cleverly add in a why and a what and a who potentially all in one headline. Uh, way easier said than done. And it often takes a long time to come up with a catchy short tagline. Um, but yeah, the what, who, how, those are the biggies. What you do, who you do it for ideally, how to get started or, or how your process works. And then if you can sprinkle in your why there, or even uh, like just put a little bit of flavor of why in there and then have a page, you know, maybe behind that, that's like your story. That's that's a really big beneficial benefit will, will help conversions. Yeah, because it's so important that when potential clients go to your site that they see immediately that they're in the right place or not. Like if, you know, a lot of, and, and some of this goes back to like when you're doing all the things too. If you're very clear about what you're doing and who you're doing it for, when those people show up looking for that particular service or skill from you, or they're in that particular industry that you serve, and then they see that, they are so much more likely to keep looking and looking and going through your website. But, you know, if somebody, let's say, comes to your website and they're in, I don't know, the security industry, but you're usually, you know, you maybe you work with, crafters you know it's like you're trying if you're trying to attract everyone you're going to you're actually going to alienate the people that you would that would want to choose you for, for your focus yes what your focus and would be now we're branching into going niche or going niche territory which is fascinating because so like i was a generalist i work with a ton of different industries but what i did my services were very detailed built websites optimize for SEO and maintain them. Those were the three big things that I did. And that was able to work with a lot of different industries. However, there's a lot of benefit into going really niche into like one industry, just like you, you talked about on my show, when I had you on my podcast, you talked about how you learned the power of just really diving into accessibility and how that separated you from everyone else. So there is a lot of power in going niche if you want to go that route. Now, I generally don't recommend going like hyper niche or hyper niche in one industry, one area of service until you know it's proven, until you're really good, until you know how you are different from a lot of the other people in, in the industry. But one thing you can do, one of my best examples of this is a colleague of mine, Jimmy Rose, runs a, a website. Oh, I know called, of him. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he runs Content Snare. Yeah. Content Snare is my favorite tool for collecting content. He built that originally for website owners and web design agencies, because mm -hmm. what's the biggest issue that all website owners have? Collecting content. Mm -hmm. um, but what was interesting is he started getting accountants and lawyers and bookkeepers oh. signing up for the tool, because what do they do? What are their biggest hassles? Collecting content as well. <laughs> so he was faced with this dilemma, like, how do I continue to work with web designers and agencies, but also cater to the people who are like signing up more. And frankly, they have bigger budgets and they, they can just pay for it better. Right. Um, what he did, what was really interesting is on the homepage, he has like links for web designers, link for bookkeepers, link for accountants and link for, I think, higher ed. And you can drill down into those pages, which have the same tool, same processes. They're just catered to that industry. So, if we can tie this in with conversions, if you're interested in working with a few different industries, 
there's your model. Yeah. Have a landing page for each industry. Even if you do website design, SEO and hosting and maintenance, those can be your services, but you can like rephrase the wording in each one of those main services. And you have got my friend, a very, very uh, chance of a higher conversion website. If you just target each service page and landing page by industry and just get a little more detail with, again, what we talked about, what you do, who you do it for. And then, then we can talk about, you know, how and, and the calls to actions. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, that reminds me of like when I was targeting like early on in my career, it was like, I got kind of niched into nonprofits because I, that was my first job out of college. I worked at a nonprofit and then other nonprofits would ask for about a designer. And then the people I worked with would refer me to do freelance work for these other organizations. So it just became a thing. And it's just snowballed into I'm always working for nonprofits, but on my website, I was like, well, I don't necessarily want to focus on nonprofits. Maybe I, you know, I was back in the I'm not going to niche or I don't want to, you know, alienate anybody, you know, yeah. <laughs> throwing it, throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks kind of thing. And whenever I was writing blog posts, I was always like, well, nonprofits use different words from businesses, you know? And so it just felt so awkward all the time to try to be talking to both audiences sure. at once. And I was just like, forget this. I'm just going to pick nonprofits and go with it. That's where my experience is. That's what people are going to come to me for, right? They always have. I'm just going to go hard into that because that makes the most sense, right? So that drove me crazy, like trying to figure out how to talk to them. The I versus right. we, and then the businesses versus nonprofits. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, I'm having an identity crisis. <laughs> yeah. And when, when in doubt, just you could talk about your services more than anything. That That's the big thing is just talk about what you do. The who you help is probably always best to come later because you'll that'll evolve over time. And I, I should say too, there's no rush and there's no sense of going like cold turkey. Like I'm just working with, I don't know, auto mechanics now. I'm like right. the popular term is like, I'm just going to build dentist sites. Like you can, but you can always ease into that if you want to. And one thing I'll say is, instead of saying these are the industries I work with, you could say we commonly work with these mm -hmm. industries. Another great conversion tip, because then yeah. if I'm a lawyer, but I see that, you know, your, your agency works with primarily auto mechanics, hairdressers, whatever, I may not be in that list, but I still know I can still work with you. I'm just, you know, maybe those are the main ones you've done so far. So that's another conversion tip too, if you are going to be a generalist, but definitely, if you find that you have a niche and you have people that you really, really work well with, by all means, go for it. It's funny. This is so timely. Just earlier today, we did a, a, I have a, a web design club, a membership of web designers. And one of my members actually presented him there today on website security. When he joined last year, I had no idea that he knew much about security. He was just a kind of a general web designer. And then as I got to know him, uh, I was like, Dan, you know a lot about security. And he's like, oh yeah. He's like, I'm super passionate about it. It's a huge area. I, I feel like people need help with it. I'm like, let's do it. Let's like, like Bill, I don't know too many people in the security side of things that aren't no. like super nerd geniuses that I can't even understand what they're saying. Or there are people <laughs> who are never going to come onto a podcast. So I was like, dude, let's go for that. So he created this whole brand called Risk Buddy that now is his endeavor to help out web designers understand security and vulnerabilities on websites. So oh wow, just a prime example of like, for me, as somebody who is a connector by nature with people, like I've got my accessibility person. Guess who that is? <laughs> that's Colleen. I've got my security guy. It's Dan. He knows a lot about security. So that's how powerful it is from a conversion standpoint when you're known for something. And that's easier said than done, but I'm kind of working on this as well because my brand has evolved a little bit recently. I'm really focusing on like the business side of web design outside of where I started, which was just how to build websites. Um, but I'm happy to talk conversions because if you're going to have a successful web design business, you better build converting websites for sure. So that's kind right. of what I'm working towards being known for, uh, just as to kind of bring it around with like a practical example. Yeah. When you become known for that one thing, everything is so much easier. I mean, my experience, I mean, I've been in the industry for 25 years and I've had my business since 2003 and nothing made as much of a difference, not even close than when I got into accessibility in 2016. And yeah. before that, I looked for like, what do I want to focus on? I mean, I tried different things, figure out what do I really want to go hard in on? I had a coach one time ask me, well, maybe you should focus on just 
design and not focus on development? Which can you take off your plate? I said, I'm a better designer than I am developer by far, right? I mean, even though I can code HTML, I'm not like a PHP JavaScript person, right? So I was like, okay, I get that off my plate. But focusing on something is like and becoming known for that. It's just, it really is like life changing. It's business changing. And it's, it's so much easier. Yes. It's also <laughs> it makes a great everything easier. It does make everything easier because you can create your messaging, your content, your services around what you do best and what you're known for. Now, you could challenge, like a little challenge I would say for everyone right now would be just to don't take any time. Just if you say, Hey, you know, Jimmy, what are you known for? Say it real quick. What do you think you're best at and what you're best known for? If you don't know, your clients may tell you by like the referrals that you're getting or the questions they have, but it's also something where sometimes you need to say, like, you need to say what you do, and that's going to help determine what you're known for. For example, when I was a generalist web designer, I was doing anything and everything. I was also a graphic designer too. So my suite of services was like 48 services ranging from video photography to brochures, to business cards, to websites, to e-commerce, all these different things. Right. As soon as I reeled those in to a package of services that was so clear, I built awesome websites. This is what's involved. The build, SEO, maintaining. That's what I chose to focus on. That's how I built my six-figure business really with a small team. But it was really figuring out what am I known for? And what what if I can say what I do really quickly in front of like a, a small group of people, which I did every week in a networking group, that was one of the things I learned from networking is we had to very concisely say, what do you do? And a few different words or less. How beneficial was that? Because then suddenly I was like, oh, I'm going to make that the headline of my website. I'm going to say exactly what I do, who I do it for, and how I do it. And boom, there we go. We just covered the what, who, how. Right. Well, I had a coach one time say to me years ago, when you're confused, your clients are going to be confused. But when you oh. have that clarity, then clients will come to you, right? And it was so true as I felt like I was living in a fog for like, I don't know how many years it was, but many years. And once I had that clarity, I felt like I was more confident. Clients were more confident. You know, so it, it made all the difference. You got to get clear. I so agree. It, that was very wise, sage advice, because if you are not clear on what you do and how you help, it, it, the client will know that. And there, it's going to be really hard to convert if you're not clear. There's a great title. Like, if you want to convert, you got to be clear. I want, that's probably a book somewhere. Um, <laughs> it's funny because I'm in a mastermind group with a, with a few colleagues. And one of the colleagues is a younger guy, super savvy. But... I think we were all like, what exactly do you do again? Actually, the leader of the group kind of asked us, like, do you guys know what he does exactly? And I felt bad because I was like, I kind of know, but I'm a little unclear. And he was even a little unclear with exactly how they help their, their clients in the best way. And it was a good challenging exercise for him to look at, like, kind of going back to our framework that we're talking about. Who does he serve and what do they do best? There's a lot of things you can do with services in your business, no matter what yep. industry you're in. But you have to decide what are the, the couple things that you're really good at that you want to do. And if you can limit that to like absolutely one thing, great. But again, it just, you need to be really good at that one thing and you need to make sure you can really deliver on one thing. In most cases for web design, you're going to do a handful of things under one kind of umbrella of packages. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. So once we've got the clients on the website and we've got that clarity and they have that clarity, they know they're in the right place. Let's talk about some things that we can do to keep them on the site, like calls to action, for example. Yes. Well, something you said there is kind of interesting because they are not going to be clients on your website until you, they click that call to action. They're actually going to be leads. Yes. Um, I'm kind of joking about that, but that is an important distinction. You have to remember everyone that visits your website and Everyone who submits a contact form is not necessarily going to be a client. You may need to like weed them out a little bit yes. before they become a good fit. So <laughs> definitely, I had, I had to learn that. And most everybody learns yeah. this. You don't want to say yes to everything. Like not everybody on your site is going to be your client. So and thank goodness for that. <laughs> thank God for that. Yes. So again, quality over quantity. But it it does, there is that that mediator between like somebody who is a lead, who's interested, who gets what you do. And then in order for them to become a client, there is that all important middle step, which is boom, your call to action. The similar mindset, 
the clearer you can get on your call to action, the better. So one thing I've seen that's really common, not only with web designers, but just in the online entrepreneurial space is people will say like, let's chat or um, say, hey, or even like, even contact me is a bit vague. So when it comes to a call to action, a button or literally the place where like you want somebody to, to do something, tell them exactly what to do. So earlier I talked about knowing the goal of the website. I had to learn this with clients. If you want people to book a free consultation, guess what your button should say? Book a free consult, like make it so clear. That way, if they click contact me, that could mean a lot of different things. Contact me could be get a quote. It could be asked a question. It could be to just casually chat. No one wants to do that. No one has time unless you're with a friend. Like that's why I have a bit of an issue with the let's chat kind of thing. I know it's personal and I know it's like, it's cute and fun, but do you really want to just chat with somebody looking at your website or do you want them to buy from you? Because if that's the case, then the button should say buy. So whatever it is, make that your call to action because that'll really help the buyer process when they know what am I doing if I sign up for this? And even I'm a fan of get started, but you have, if you say get started, you need to clarify what get, uh, does get started. Mm, mean. That's a good point. Does it mean get started on a proposal or does it mean when I click get started, I'm going to an invoice right after that. So state very clearly what that call to action is. And I promise you it's going to help clear things up so much better and it, it'll help with conversions. Okay. That's great. Those are great tips. Now, how important do you think blogging is? Because I think blogging and having content on your website is very important because that's helping search engines lead people to your website. But a lot of designers hate writing or they think they can't do it. And it's very hard sometimes to get started. I know I found it very difficult to get started at first, but then once I did, I was like, oh my gosh, there's so many things I could talk about, right? Like, cause you got like questions from clients. You've got things you want them to know about like maybe preparing files or case studies, things like that. So, you know, how important do you think blogging is and putting out fresh content? So there's, there's definitely a difference between content as an umbrella term and just blogging. Um, I think blogging is, I mean, you don't have to do it per se, but it is extremely beneficial. I, I feel like there's a new window of opportunity for people who do want to blog and build resources and content on their site as far as like written content, because so many people aren't doing it now. A lot of people are focusing on social media and quick content and quite frankly, on, on platforms that are more interruptive to where you said it, Colleen, blogging on your site brings people to it who are looking for answers to a question or it's bringing people who are gonna stay on the site longer. Another conversion tip that I've learned over the years, especially recently, there's this currency in the online world that not many people talk about, but it's really important. And that is average time on site. So going back to the Google Analytics thing we talked about earlier, or any analytics, average time on site is a metric that I would definitely pay attention to. Because if people are leaving your site at 30 seconds versus if they're staying on there for an average of like two or three or four minutes, that means somebody's engaging with your site. They're staying on there. And what is Google like? Google likes sites that people don't leave from really quick. So blogging can definitely assist with that. Yes, blogging can be a lot of work. And it kind of goes back to the idea of the goal. Like, okay, if the goal of my website is to get a certain type of client, that's going to help your content strategy because, uh, and I know this, when I started blogging, I unintentionally started this brand new career for myself as a content creator. But when I started my blog on my agency site, I was kind of blogging about personal stuff and web design stuff and not really things for my clients. So my clients didn't really care about necessarily all my blog posts. And what I found that I was doing, and this is really common with web designers, is they'll start doing blogging or content creation, and then they create content for other web designers. But if other web designers aren't going to pay you for a service, you don't want to write for them. You want to write for your clients. So I definitely recommend it. I would start small. I would do like once a month and make it a just good article that's real. I mean, you could get more advanced eventually with SEO and keywording and, and all that stuff, but it's a really good practice. I would also potentially, if you're going to do blogging or any sort of content creation for the sake of conversion, have the goal in mind for sure. And I would say, just like, try it out, give yourself light at the end of the tunnel, 
for example, when I first started doing content, I committed to doing 12 videos on my YouTube channel. That's how I started my joshhall.co YouTube channel. And I can't tell you how beneficial that was because I didn't feel the overwhelm of just nonstop content forever. It was like, okay, mm -hmm. once a week for three months, 12 videos, I can do that. And when you start creating content, you'll learn you can bulk record or bulk write and then schedule it out. So that's the way I would approach that. And again, write for your clients, your ideal clients. Yes. You'll, you probably already know some of the challenges they have, but just ask them. Like if you have 10 clients, ask them, what are the things you're confused about or you want to know more about? Boom. You probably got like eight articles you could write on for the next couple months or half a year. And then suddenly you've got a catalog of content on your website that makes you look like an expert, mm -hmm. helps build authority, you'll gain confidence, and it'll definitely help you convert because SEO, there's SEO benefits. And then you've also, like you mentioned, you've got a resource of like library, like a library of growing resources that you can send to your clients. So, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I could keep on going, but that's, I definitely <laughs> recommend it. Well, and the other thing too is like, you can ask them questions, like you're saying, to find out what problems they have. I had issues with that early on in my career because I would be asking the wrong question because I would be basing it on design and not the end goal, the problem they're trying to solve, right? Or they would answer with something that was related to design. And it's like, you really want to get out of that and, and focus on asking them business related problems. Even if they're nonprofits, they're, they're still have to run things like a business, right? They still have to bring in income, but asking them things like that, because that helps you understand too, like how you can serve them better. And you're not just looked at like an order taking designer. Yeah, that's a great point. I, and I definitely recommend that when you're working with clients and helping them out with their copy and messaging, which inevitably you're going to get into that realm as a web designer, unless they work with a copywriter who absolutely does everything, you're probably going to tweak the copy and mess with the SEO functionality of that. Um, yeah, 100%. Ask about their customers and ask about the problems they solve because that will that will help you with the copy and the content. Bringing it back to like, asking a, a client what's their challenges to help with your, your content, you could ask that in a more tactful way. Like you could say, what questions do you have about website stuff? And then they're going to be like, oh, okay. So website, it's going to be, you know, design or they're not going to say conversions, but they're just going to be like, no one's filling out the contact form. Yeah. They unintentionally just told you a conversion tip and you can write an article now that says how to get more leads to sign your, fill out your contact form. Literally, you could do that and then give them tips on conversions that you're learning right here today. So there's a lot of different ways to go about it like that. That's a little more tactful. It, it's kind of the same principle of like the more clear and detailed you can get will help everything because it could be the same with how you ask questions to clients. Yeah. And, you know, you were saying about having this content out there, it helps you position you as an expert, but I think it also really helps as part of that. It helps the sales process too. It makes the sales process easier because the more that they see that you've written about this and how much, you know, cause they don't know as yes. much as you do. They, they see you as an expert, but they also they're learning from it, but they're like, this person knows what they're doing. And if it's down to you and some other designer, maybe they feel more confident in you because of these things that you've put out there, because you're also being seen as helpful sharing this information. So it's not just saying like, Hey, look what I know. It's also saying, yes. look, I'm being helpful. I'm trying to, you know, help you understand this, this stuff better. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Here are some tips. Here are my ideas. Here what I here's what I recommend. Here's something that worked for one of my clients. Even if you don't want to name them, you can say like, here's what I did. Here's what worked for this client. Try it out. The more helpful you are, first of all, that will help you write a blog post because you can just share what you know. And yeah. really important point you just said, Colleen, you look like an expert towards your clients. It doesn't mean that you need to be an expert towards your competition or towards other web designers or agencies. But for people who don't know anything about websites, you are going to be their expert. And even if Josh or Colleen knows way more than you know this person over here, your, their client knows this person and they're like, well, I already trust you. Yeah. You, you know, a lot to, to me, let's do it. Mm -hmm. So such an important point. You don't need to be an expert in the field. You just need to share what you know. And even if you just know a little bit, you look like the expert to your clients mm -hmm. and to your potential clients. That's all you need to grow a nice, healthy, six figure fun web design business. We want to have like something that's going to build trust other than that. So that's one way to build trust is putting out content yeah. like that. But let's talk about like social proof and 
testimonials and things like that. Oh, you know, there's actually one thing I might say before that as well that I think is really important. Th this, I cannot believe how many people still do this to this day. Oh, and that is, here we go. I hope when I'm not have, guilty of it. <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me see. Uh, nope, you're not. You're not guilty. Okay, good. You're on Woo, there. I'm off the hook. The okay. other thing is saying who the heck is behind the brand. Like if I went to creativeboost.com and you didn't have that section that said, I'm Colleen, I, I wouldn't know who's behind this. And sometimes that's intentional if it is a team, but I still recommend having like a meet the team section in a homepage because nowadays more than ever, people want to know who they're going to work with. It's so important. I think maybe like in the early thousands, people liked the agency where it was like, well, we're working with an agency. It's so cool. But again, that the years of that left a very sour taste in people's mouth because they got burned or felt like a number on a spreadsheet. So when you have a website, even if you don't want to come across as a solopreneur, still say who is buying the brand because people want to know. I it's one of the things I work with with a lot of my new students who come into some of my courses in my community is I'll look at their website and I'm like, I have no idea who's behind this. I don't know if it is a team of 25 people paying rent downtown in a building or if it's one person, you know, working from home. I have no idea. So again, say who is behind this. And we've already talked about the ways as you can implement going from me to we share, you know, if you work with a couple people regularly, put them on there. It's like me and a few people who help you out or it's me, but I have an incredible network of web designers behind yep. me. <laughs> say who it is. It's so beneficial for conversions because people are not going to move forward if they don't know who the heck they're going to talk to. Uh, another little uh, sub sub uh, title tip under there is after somebody submits a contact form or get a quote, another really cool tip is to let them know who they're about to hear from. Mm -hmm. So if I, this was a really interesting tip that I actually, it could work out in a, in a different, a ton of different ways, depending on the sales process. Like if that gets the conversation started, and they just submit a contact form and it's like, thanks for contacting us. They're like, okay, uh, who am I going to hear from? How long is this going to take? Like <laughs> right. let people know once they get started, once they open the door, what's the next step? Here's who you're going to hear from. It may be me. It may be an assistant or how long is it going to take? Like you'll expect to hear from us generally within 48 hours between Monday and Friday. Those things go such a long way with conversions yeah. because just remember, you may convert quote unquote people into a get a quote form or a contact form, but that doesn't make them a client yet. That makes them a warm lead. Yeah. So if you really want people to convert, the website is like the first part. The next part typically is like the follow-up process. And I, we don't have to dive too far into that, but it is a really important aspect because you can measure conversions as far as like, if your conversion is a contact form submission, then okay, you hit your goal. But if your goal is a sale, then there's like a, a layer back of conversions that you need to follow up with. And yeah, just having like a simple confirmation page that says who you're going to hear from, what the expectation is. My gosh, it goes such a long way. I think that's another thing that helps position you as an expert because it's saying, I have a process. I've done this before. I do this all the time. It's like rolling out the red carpet. I mean, clients love attentiveness. Yeah. They love responsiveness. <laughs> they love that. And it just, you said it, it looks awesome. And it's so easy to do. My, that would be another challenge that you could do like wherever you are right now, unless you're driving or mowing the lawn or something like <laughs> pause this, add a really cool confirmation page. Don't take more than an hour on it. Just get version one up, say, after your contact form, we got your message. If it's just me who's going to contact you, I'll be in contact with you generally within 24 hours during these days. Boom. There you go. You're done. I remember when I was using Basecamp for project management, which I loved for many years, and I had a support question and I went through their support channel and it was a confirmation page I got taken to. And it said like, we got it. We usually get back within 24 hours. You'll hear from this person, this person, or this person. And I remember the one guy emailed me and I was like, oh, that's so cool. Uh -huh. Like I saw his picture on the confirmation page and he really did get back with me and it was him. So yeah, it just adds so much to the personal touch and those things that are going to help convert that. Again, I feel like a lot of people don't talk about it too much when you hear about conversions. Some of the tips we've probably glanced over are pretty common, but like the idea of a really cool confirmation page is not super sexy, but it's super powerful. 
Yeah, I mean, you could even have like a video on there of yourself, thing like saying thanks for contacting yes. me or something. You know, just something mm -hmm. to show your personality. It makes you more memorable because people, nobody's doing that, so you'll be remembered. Yes. Oh, who was that cool designer that had that really cool confirmation page? You know, <laughs> and uh, the more personalized you can get on your website and in your entire process, that will help with conversions. Because one thing to remember is, in web design in particular for a lead, they're probably talking with a few different designers and a yeah. few different agencies. So you got to separate yourself. You, I mean, I, something you talk about on this podcast a lot, I think pretty much every tagline that you say, <laughs> you want to separate yourself from your competition. Yes. So the more personalized you can get with those cool little things, wow, super powerful. Yeah. And you made a really good point a few minutes ago, but I wanted to just reiterate it. And when you were talking about the expectations of with cold leads and warm leads, a lot of designers get really upset, get really disappointed when people come to their site or they have a sales call with them and then they don't hire them or they connect with them on LinkedIn or something and they don't hire them or they email them asking for like if they have work and they don't hire them. And it's like, you have to understand that if people don't know you yet, why are they suddenly going to be like, yeah, I'm going to hand over my money to you. I don't know you yet. I don't know your work. I don't, you know, so there's so many questions and like this whole process of removing doubt is like all about going, ha taking them through that journey so that they do work with you. And just because they say no, I'm a marketing mentor, at least Ben and always has said this is no now does not mean no later. It just means no right now. That's a good point. That's a great point. And there's, there's so many tips and tricks and talks and, and different ideas about conversion rates as far as like sales in general. I once had a guy who I think he did sales for like some sort of airline manufacturing part. It was real mm. niche and real weird. But when I first started my business, I just talked with as many business owners as I could just asking them about their tips. And he told me, Josh, we were sitting at a Bob Evans. I'll never forget it one morning. And he said, sales are 20%. He's like, if you can do 20%, you're good. You're, you're going to make enough as long as you charge enough for your services. And some would say that's really low. Um, I'd probably venture to say that like out of 10 people, I want at least five of them probably to move forward. But as you up your value, you are going to get less clients. So luckily you don't have to sell as much, but it also, th this brings to an interesting point where when it comes to a conversion, you generally want to weed people out who are not a good fit. Yes. So for the designer who the designer who talks to 10 people and all 10 say no, that's not going to go well. Number 1, I would say that's probably something on your end. You got to get your messaging right and figure out what you do cuz generally you want to have at least one person out of 10 people. But the other aspect of that is well maybe they're just they're not great fits. Like maybe you don't even want them as clients or maybe through your bad messaging and and confusion on your own design, maybe you're not attracting the right people and they're just yeah. not getting what you do. So I think everything we've talked about to this point will help with, with converting people once they get to that point. But then oh, yeah. a whole nother topic of this conversation is like, how do you weed people out? And luckily you can do that with your messaging, with who you serve, and then price point. Like yeah. how like you don't have to say exactly how much something might be if it's if you have to do a custom quote, but you can have ranges and that will really help weed the people out who are not good fits. And then you can just focus on getting on calls with people who are a really good lead. And then if you're having trouble closing at that point, then maybe it's something that you need to work on with your service. But it's probably just a few little tweaks you need to do to, to boost your conversions as far as selling. So true. Well, so you know, I think lead magnets, well, a lot of designers don't have lead magnets. I think lead magnets are a really great way. By what I mean a lead magnet, I mean like a free guide. So somebody's going to the website, they're filling out a form, they're giving you their name and email address, and they're downloading a free guide, and they're holding on to that. So they're reminded of you later after they leave your website or when maybe they're not online. So what do you think about those? I, th I think they're beneficial. I definitely, because I grew my business and I never had a lead magnet, I know you don't need to have it. Right. But I will say it's really beneficial going back to the thought that you talked about where it's not a yes now, but maybe it'll be a yes later. Like for example, if you have a free guide on like, what did we talk about earlier? The contact form thing. So it's like five tips to help people actually fill your, your contact form out. Mm, yeah. You can have your five tips. Somebody signs up for it. And again, if you're working with small businesses, you're not going to get 
thousands of signups, but it's quality over quantity. And if they sign up for that, and if you email them once a month and you just have some tips that you've learned, maybe pulled from your blog that you wrote, maybe a case study on a, a website that went really well, then maybe six months from then, maybe that's when they pull the trigger, but it's because you've stayed top of mind with your email. Uh, you definitely don't need to be an online marketer and have this huge campaign, but getting people on your email list, you can really prime them to be hot leads. Whether you have 10 or 100 or 10,000, it doesn't matter, particularly when they're paying high dollar, like high dollar projects. Definitely recommend it. Um, but it is probably a strategy I would say that is going to be a little more useful for like filling in the gaps of the feast and famine of design. Uh, because then you have like you have a list of you know 32 people who you can email and that will definitely attract clients as long as you just give them some value and stay top of mind. Yeah. And like you said, it doesn't matter what the numbers are because I mean, I can tell you, like, even though I've been doing this a long time, had my business a long time, I've always had what anybody would call consider a small email list. And I didn't have a lead magnet for many years because nobody was doing them back when I started. So yeah, it's totally possible to do that. Yeah. One of my students had, I think, 80 some people on his list. And he was like, gosh, I thought I'd have like 500, but I only have like 80. I'm like, dude, that's fine. Get try it out. And he did some emails like once a month and it did pay off for him. Like, yeah, not that. I think maybe three or four people over the course of a year signed up. But if those three or four people are paying five to $10,000, guess what? You may, that, that small email effort may have been worth 20 to 30 to $40,000 just right. doing that. So, so beneficial. Social proof, like testimonials or reviews, things like that. I think that's helpful too. Definitely. The people don't Definitely. want to be the first one to try you out. <laughs> uh, right. And so oh, that perfect. What a setup. What a segue. So the, the big question is for people early on, what if I don't have any reviews or testimonials? Oh, How do I get good clients? Point. So what I always recommend doing, this has worked for me and it's worked for a lot of my students who are in the beginning phases, is I very hesitantly say this, but if you do any work for trade-off or for free, First of all, keep it constrained and limited to what you'll do. That way you don't spend a hundred hours for nothing, but require a testimonial and you can build your portfolio and then you can have two or three testimonials that will make you look awesome. Now, somebody might say, well, Josh, what if, if I only have three clients, is that going to look bad? Here's my other little hidden trick on how to have like three testimonials and make it look awesome. Call it featured work or recent work. And that's all potential clients need to know. They don't need to know how many clients. I never had any clients ask me, how many people have you worked with? No. Because it doesn't matter. Now, they may ask, like, have you worked with a barbershop before? Right. In which case, if I had, awesome. If not, I would say no. But, you know, with a lot of the principles I've designed on other sites, I think it'll work fine for you. And we'll do some extra research and stuff. Boom. You're good. Um, so when it comes to social proof, just get two or three. Three tends to look better in columns on websites. Add an image for sure. Ideally, add a client image because if you just have a blurb with text, you're going to glance right over it. So have an image of the person, a little bit of text, little bit of text, not a paragraph, just a little bit, and then boom, you're golden. And if they were free clients that you did work for, they didn't pay, no one needs to know that. That is right. our little secret. That right. is our little secret. But right. there you go. Featured work recent client thoughts, something like that. You're good. I think too, you could ask, like if you're working, a, I worked a full-time job in freelance for seven years before I went out on my own. And when I needed to get testimonials on my website, I asked coworkers, can you give me a testimonial? I want to put it on my website. And I had so many of them that were like, yeah, no problem. Or even like colleagues that had worked on a, you know, a project with me and they could speak for my work ethic or the quality of the work or something like that. So that was really helpful too. And then I would just replace them with client testimonials, you know, as I go. got more work. That's what I was going to say. Just replace them as soon as you can. But yeah, I mean, you definitely don't want to like do it in a shady way or false right. advertise, but if you actually do work for somebody, even if it's free again, it's still the work that you did. They don't need to know they didn't pay if that's right. the case. Uh, but either way, yeah, don't neglect social proof because it's so important. And some people may say that people don't look at reviews or testimonials. I do. My wife does. That's really important. I totally when do. It when it comes to service and you will get a feel of somebody has written a review that's like generic or robotic or if it's real, 
you know, like, and then if you can have people give some sort of result in a review, that's when it's, when it's really beneficial. Yeah. That leads us to a whole nother topic, which can lead <laughs> into case studies. And I will yes. say something I would recommend diving into is like, if you have a good result for a client, do not let that go. Cause talk about a conversion. You could have a little case study, which guess what? Ding, ding, ding becomes a blog post. And you can talk about the yes. challenges that they had, how you solve that, the, where the client is now with their website, their traffic, their conversions. And then that is your sales tool. You could use one case study for a year and just pump it out over and over and over to people. And there you go. Yeah. And you can promote it on social media, you know, so there's that too, but yeah, cause a lot of designers put up the portfolio work, but they don't put up any text and the text is what's going to help search engines come like lead people to the site. So having right. the text on there is so important. Yeah. And, uh, there's another little SEO trick is I learned this from having a portfolio with websites that each had their own dedicated page. When people Google the company, if your site starts getting ranked, your portfolio page and your work will likely start showing up on search results. So there's a bunch of extra traffic who may end up being a really good potential client for you. The only last thing I'll say that I might recommend doing that I see overlooked a lot is to have a footer call to action. So what happens that I see is like a lot of designers will work really hard in the, the hero section of the website above the fold. We're talking to designers here, so I can talk that lingo, like right when you see the website. And then what happens? The design just kind of starts to fizzle. And then by the time you get to the bottom, it's just like, it's, you know, it's just like, but what a perfect time if somebody does make it all the way down on a homepage, don't leave them hanging, have a section and have like, okay, so like, are you ready to get started or give them some urgency? And then even if it's the exact same call to action that's up top, like have that down there. You'll see with a lot of really popular platforms that they'll always generally have two call to actions or more because people may glance over it. And then by the time you get down to a page, they're like, what? Like, how do I get started? If there's no glaring call to action from them uh, or no fixed menu, then that's, it's really important. So yeah, have a footer call to action. That's my last tip on that. This has been chock full of tips. This has been really great. You can go to my website, joshhall.co. There's a ton of different resources there. Um, what is the driver of my business is my online courses. So if anyone wants to take a guess at what my call to action is, it's to check out my courses. Uh, so that is, I mean, honestly, you go to my website and my, my brand is an interesting case study because I have so much different content. It was really hard for me to rein in strong calls to actions because I've got people in very different places of their journey and stuff. But I just learn what's the most beneficial thing for me. How do I give my students the best result? It's my courses. So um, you're welcome to check those out if this would fit for anyone. But just go to joshhall.co. I have a, a podcast there called the Web Design Business Podcast. Yeah, great podcast. Links to my socials if you want to connect with me. And yeah, Colleen was on recently on, on my show, the Web Design Business Podcast. You were back on episode uh, 214, which wasn't that long ago. Uh, and yeah, a lot of great talk about accessibility. So if you're in the web design business world, that's definitely a resource I recommend. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, Colin. Yeah. I hope this was beneficial and I hope it's fun. Conversions are fun yeah. because conversions equal, uh, money and freedom. So if this content was helpful, you can support the podcast by buying me a coffee. It might actually end up being a glass of wine or some tea, but you could go to buymeacoffee.com slash creative boost.